Living what we call today a sustainable lifestyle, taking only what we need and replacing what we take, has been the indigenous people's way of life for 10,000 years. The sustainable lifestyle concept is now beginning to make itself known in communities across the country and cultures throughout the world. Applying this concept in our lives individually and collectively, using it to learn about the trees in our community, will be enough to engage the spirit to actively protect and preserve our trees and our Mother Earth for the next seven generations. We already know of symbiotic relationships between trees and people. This relationship depends heavily on biodiversity and cultural diversity and a strong human longing to protect and preserve our trees and forests. We are also aware that the healthy life of a forest depends in part on the gracious elements of death. Animals, birds, plants, insects, and all forms of life give back their bodies to Mother Earth, and the forest is renewed again and again, back to the circle of life. The Anishinaabe people on the White Earth Reservation have begun tending the scrawny forest acreage that was left to them. Since maple syruping has been one of their ancestral traditions, they look to the past for ways to recover their self-reliance as a tribe. Using patience, observation, innate knowledge, wisdom, and respect for the forests, the Anishinaabe have begun nurturing a regenerative, sustainable maple syruping enterprise. When indigenous people walk in the forest, we are keenly aware of the living presence of our ancestors. The Anishinaabe people speak of the land as being alive, having spirit. It only stands to reason that we would care deeply for the place of our ancestors, the forest of Mother Earth. In our language, things which are around us are alive. They have standing, they have spirit on their own. And that is uh, how we look at our forests. We're a part of these forests, our ancestors are in this forest, and we ourselves come from and return to the forest. When you walk around this forest here, the feeling and what you know is that all your old people walked around the same forest before you. And that is why we are here today. There are some things that you cannot just take. There's, there's, there's nothing left to take on this reservation. What is left in our community is that which is coming back like us, like us Anishinaabeg people. This forest is coming back and we need that forest in order to be us. And we need to have this ecosystem just as, as few as we are, that's as few as this forest is. And that is what we need to preserve for our community and for, for all people. Because I am someone who believes and knows in my heart that biodiversity is as important as cultural diversity. And those two things are entirely related. And that to be able to speak our language here in this forest, to hear our songs in this forest, to have our ceremonies in this forest, and to do something that is what we were instructed to do by the Creator. There is nobody else who has the experience of living sustainably in North America besides us Native people. There is nobody who has lived for 10,000 years on this land and lived in the same forest for 10,000 years but us. And that is what we wish to do. We wish to be able to allow to continue doing that. And we believe that that is of value for all Americans. We believe that that is of value for all people that we are able to sustain and to continue our way of life. A lot of these trees are, uh, their barks are medicine.
even the pine, even the pines, you see the rosin. You take the bark off and you see the rosin run out of there. That's, they use that for medicine too. Then a lot of the leaves are medicine too. Just like these grass here. Who any old people was living in, they can point out some some herbs here that we don't know nothing about. People walk on good old Mother Earth without the respect of what they're standing on. Our sweat lodge a gift of the Great Spirit is one of the sacred ceremonies we use for purification to cleanse ourselves mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We also use it for worship and for healing. Willow saplings are cut to make the ribs of the lodge with the branches covering the roof, and tobacco offerings are made. Through the power of the Great Spirit, the four elements Fire, water, earth, and air, centered in the lodge, provide the means for cleansing and rebirth. The lodge is going to be shaped into a womb, and the ribs are the willow branches. And uh, when we crawl into the womb and we go through the purification of the lodge, we come out, we're reborn. We had that sacred fire last night with the red cedar, and that was very powerful to me because it felt like we were being smudged all night. And that, that wood that we shared in that fire come from a tree that was downed. You know, there's a lot of wood in these areas that we can use without cutting down a tree. And I think, you know, I'm a grandmother. We, we have to learn how to bring back the respect in caring for things to last generations. Instead of going out and every time a new trend comes and buying new things, we have to learn, you know, when something is made of wood, that a life was given for that, the life of that tree. So when we buy that item, we have to respect the life that was given for that. And we, we take care of that in a sacred manner. That's not just a table we eat at. It's a life we share with. I think that we can, we can all become far more environmental when we start seeing our concept of the Creator, our concept of the higher power, through what it makes. The creator makes nature. Nature is a revelation of the Creator. How things work in nature is an indicator how we should live our lives. And uh, balance, honesty, understanding, observation, all these things you will see in nature. And if we apply that to our life, I think we'll be far more advanced as a community. If you cut a cottonwood tree in two, there's a heart shape. So <coughs> this denotes that it's very, very sacred. So that's why we usually always use the cottonwood tree for our sacred sun dance. That's the tree we always cut down and we bring it into the center of the arena, as I mentioned earlier, and we erect it and we dance around that tree. Wagachan is the way we say the sacred cottonwood tree. So a tree is always a part of us. We call them the standing ones. Standing ones, the silent ones, and they're on guard clear across the land. They're, they're sentinels clear, clear across America. And uh, they're very holy, very revered. They've given us everything. They've made our country so bountiful. 
You just go through any city, you'll see all the houses underneath that paint. Those are trees. The tree is a very sacred uh, entity that we have and of course we wish to preserve. Through careful planning and management, the Menominee Forest has supplied over two and a half billion board feet of saw timber. Yet, the volume of standing timber is now greater than in 1854 when the Wolf River Treaty created the present Menominee Reservation. MTE has not interfered with the natural process here. And, and as you can see, beech and hemlock, there's a lot of these younger trees here. The pine naturally will, will die off. There'll be no more pine here. And this will change to hardwood. And there's, there's quite a few plants unique to this area, like the um, bead lily, the oak fern, and sometimes a little uh, blue cohosh and lady fern grow here. These plants tell us that this stand is, has a capability of growing nice hardwood here. As you can see on a 1914 map, the reservation has changed. That's a photograph that shows where the forest has not been cut. Where you see the, the lighter areas, that's where farm fields are. F ever since Columbus arrived here, these forest plants were here and we have not cut the forest, clear cut it. So these plants still produce their seeds all through these years and they do not have to, we don't have to replant these plants, they've come back naturally. The land ethic of the Lakota tribal people reflects the interwoven relationship between the land, water, and sky. It is said of the Lakota that the sacredness of the land is their very body, the values of the culture, their very soul. I have a very good relationship with the wind, and there's much that the wind will tell you. If you're, if you're willing to listen to it, that when they bring messages to me th through the cottonwood tree, you can tell it, you can tell, hear the difference in when just the wind hits the leaf of a, of a, of a cottonwood tree. And when uh, it stops, the wind stops, and the voices come to you. There, there's distinct different sounds. And, um, Many times when you, when you know your ancestors are around, they come through the trees. The cottonwood tree is sacred to the Sioux. It's our, our life. It's our, you know, water is uh, the essence of life, and that comes through the cottonwood tree. The plant life that we're related to and all of the insect world is here for a purpose, and part of that is the cleansing process of the water when it goes across the land. And when you pollute those grasses and, and uh, try to kill those insects with chemicals, you know, that's exactly what you're doing, is that you're poisoning your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren's future. And it's at what point that you have to make the decision that you are responsible for the next generations and you should be thinking of the next seven generations. Our children have an inherent connection to the trees. The forest cathedrals nurture their spirit and we pass on to them the cultural traditions that link them to the great Mother Earth. In the school, we teach the children to honor Mother Earth and uh, she is called um, and um, she is supposed to be the one that um, um, nurtures everything that we have here on, on this planet Earth. And um, the children are taught not to uh, put trash all over her and also to um, keep it clean and also not to put nails in the trees because um, the Indian believes that uh, you're hurting the tree. I mean, that they all have feelings. They're just like, like people. We consider them like people. 
We could never live any place where there was not no trees. We'd be lost without them. Our medicines come from the forests, from the, the fields, the swamps. And we have to teach the people how to take care of that, or it's not going to be there for the coming generations. I go out, get my bark when I should. I always put my tobacco out. I say my prayers. I thank the trees for giving me this. Thank the creator for putting that tree there. Even with my porcupines, most of them are road kills. But I always put that tobacco out because I'm using them. I go out later in the summer and I get my sweet grass. This has been braided. And I got very angry at the people that gave this to me because here on the end, I can see the roots, which means they just yanked it up out of the ground. And when I go out and gather it for myself, I always cut it so it'll grow back. So next couple of years, I can go back to that spot, and that sweet grass will be ready for me to pick again. When receiving a gift from the Creator and Mother Earth, the Anishinaabe know that nothing is to be wasted. Even the deer hooves were used as rattles for this drum cover. This is one of the items that I handcraft. This is made all by hand. And um, the only thing that's used on here that I purchased in the store would be the pony beads and the brass beads here. All the rest of it is taken from nature. Uh, the buckskin from the deer, Wawashkeshi, um, who lives in a forest. Um, and uh, myself as Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, as many people call us, are woodland people. And we often go into the woods every year to harvest um, things for our crafts that are natural resources and white earth. And also uh, we hunt and trap um, all our animals that are on our traditional diet. Tobacco grown for prayer offerings is an important element in tribal tradition. It's part of living life in balance, taking only what you need and respecting what is taken through an offering of tobacco and a prayer in thanksgiving to the Creator. When used in a pipe ceremony, smoke is taken into the body and then released as a prayer to the Creator. The smoke rises and takes our message to the Creator. This plant here is native tobacco. Only certain people have the rights to grow it. And when you're given that right, you have to live in a certain way. And whenever you're dealing or working with this, you have to do certain things, which I'm not going to go into. But this plant was, uh, or the seeds for it, were passed down from generation to generation. When I was younger, my grandfather, Wilbur Blackdeer, allowed me to help him with his plants. And after years of doing that, finally one day he uh, said if I wanted to grow it, I could have the right. So he gave me seeds and I started growing and I've been growing it ever since. I'll have to do this every year for the rest of my life. This is a black ash log that we have here that we use for baskets. And the reason that this log is, uh, is so long is because when we use it for pack baskets, we get a log that's about five feet and seven inches long. And so, um, and then we, we choose a log that, uh, where the growth rings are a certain thickness. And you'll notice that the growth rings, every year this, this tree grows uh, one more ring every part of this log has to be hammered so the growth rings will separate and so um, we're going to be hammering some of this right now and to 
uh, showing how it comes off in the log first. It's actually the best way to take it right off in the log and use it while it's damp. And uh, it's, it's a lot easier to work with. Once it gets dry, it takes a little time to, to soak it back down, but all wood has pores in it, and it will absorb the moisture. After we've hammered it, then we're, we're starting to pull the, the, one of the growth rings off in here right now. And uh, now this log has been hammered before. Uh, we've taken we've taken a lot off in this log already. So as you hammer, then what happens? It comes off easier every time. You don't have to hammer it so much. The first time, you have to do a lot of hammering. This I need to bend. Uh, I need to bend this, and I need to score it with a knife. And then we need to split it. And you have to do it just so, otherwise you'll pull it out. So we, uh, we keep pulling on the heavy side. Notice how rough that is. And we need to get some of that off in there. But that will be the inside of the basket. And you hold your knife at a certain angle, the right angle, you can, you can scrape that. Uh, so we don't have all that, all that rough uh, bark on the inside. So there is certain, certain things that we have to do in order to make a nice looking basket out of it. Then what we do is put this in here and push this down and we pull this through and uh, cut all of our our splint into size to to size it and get it ready for the basket through the artist's resourcefulness patience and creativity the spirit of the tree changes its shape becoming a woven basket through the tenacity wisdom and dedication of menominee tribal elders like Chief Oshkosh, when the Europeans arrived, the Menominee did not yield their great forest lands, the wildlife areas along the Wolf River and Kashina Falls. They have never forgotten their roots as people of the forests. Today, the Menominee tribal enterprise is recognized as one of the world's finest examples of sustainable yield forestry which is to cut the trees of a forest at such a rate and in such a manner as to sustain its existence forever. Many people are suffering from a lack of human rights. And without human rights recognition, the human or the resource and the forestry management to long term is just about impossible. Uh, I look back in, in, in Menominee's history without recognition of, of, of their human rights as a people in that, I think the long-term forestry management would not have been existent. Although a lot of people did not recognize uh, Native Americans, especially in the late 1800s, there was a large populace that was appalled by the uh, U.S. treatment to American Indians. And it was that group that, that helped uh, strive for long-term management in the tribe's interest there. And without that recognition, uh, forestry and long-term uh, forest management is just about impossible. Forestry on Menominee is basically cutting mature trees, thinning trees to improve the growth, and regeneration uh, of, of timber species uh, using natural means or artificial means. Uh, we're literally an island of timber in an ocean of cleared land. We don't have control over everything off the reservation. But what we do know is land that is abused will someday have net effect or negative effect 
on our resource. So if we can kind of spread uh, the knowledge base of, of long-term forestry use, better forestry use, in the long run, we'll be the beneficiary of that also. It all goes with water quality, uh, insect, disease, the timber itself. If, uh, if there is a shortage of timber worldwide and we have timber yet, we may be able to have a real unique market where we could even make a lot of money. But also what comes with, with that is having the only resource on due pressure on the tribe. And we have already had in our history pressure like that, and it was called termination, people lusting after the land. When the pressure is so scarce, or the resource is so scarce, the forestry resource is so scarce here like we have, uh, most of that pressure the tribe cannot sur survive under. So we don't want the forest resource to become that scarce where we would receive that much pressure and lose the forest resource ourselves. So we want to share. We want to share our knowledge. We want to share our abilities and our philosophies to other people.